Okay. Um, now, if if um, if you want to look at other scriptures on the same same incident, you can look at. Uh, I've just put it on the chat for the online students. Um, it's Matthew twenty six six to thirteen, right? Matthew chapter twenty six six to thirteen. You can write that down, and also Mark chapter fourteen verses three to nine. Okay. Mark chapter 14, verses 3 to 9. Um, John's gospel also has this. John chapter 12 and verses 1 to 8. Yeah, the same um, incident. But John's gospel, uh, is there seems to be a slight variation because it's about... Um, uh, it's in the house of Lazarus and... Um, it talks about Mary taking a point, uh, I mean, uh, a costly spike nard and then doing that. So, so that is something that we see, right? So we see, we, it seems to be like two incidents. Um, so John's gospel seems to be very different. So seems to be two different instances, right? Okay. So you can study it. It's interesting. And... Um, it's challenging also, you know, challenging for us. Um, and also, we understand that time spent with the Lord or in the presence of the Lord, truly, there is change, there is transformation. right? And our response to that change and transformation and forgiveness and love that we experience, um, you know, that's, that's worship. Right? So we need to understand that and I think we are, you know, we are getting a better understanding right from the Hebrew words that we studied and uh, from the postures of worship that we looked at, the expressions of praise that we looked at, right? We see that, you know, it's multifaceted, right? It's not just, I don't think we can ever, you know, at this point we can say, okay, worship is the songs that we sing, right? I think we've, that is left far behind, right? That understanding you know, of worship and songs, now, though it is a big part of it, but we know that it's not merely that, right? Okay, so as we continue on to, you know, becoming worshippers, right? So in our own lives, in our own journey, that we should, you know, intentionally become worshippers of the Most High God. Right? Because He's seeking, what is the Father seeking? He's seeking worshippers. And where do we see that? In the words of the Lord Jesus, John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, that the Father is seeking who will worship in spirit and in truth. So it's not just that moment alone, but it's truly uh, our journey with Him, right? our walk with Him. right? It's a moment-by-moment -moment daily thing, which we call you know, the, our journey with God, our relationship with God. So we understand that. right? So in this particular... Uh, incident, we see that brokenness, tears, you know, repentance, a very truly an expression of worship. We see that. Um, the other Greek word that we can look at, um, I'm just looking at the notes, is uh, proskunio, which means just, to just go prostrate before the Lord. And it has this picture of, you know, kissing of the hand, right, in deep reverence, right? So to bow oneself in adoration, to kiss the hand, uh, as an act of worship, right? Another truth that we learn from this whole instance is that, and other instances, is that our act of worship, right? Our worship to the Lord may not be understood, may not be appreciated by those around us. Okay, it's not like everybody is going to say, "Wow, this person really, this really worships God in spirit and truth." No, they will not say that. Yes, there might be some who understand, but there will be many who do not understand. Right? who think that hey, it's such a waste, waste of time, waste of energy, waste of resources, right? I remember having a conversation where we, we, we had this, you know, as a church, we had this season of seeking God, you know, 40 days, and it was uh, sometime, uh, you know, uh, many years ago, uh, every evening, two hours of just seeking the Lord. And I remember one, one uncle asking, you know, but why? You know, why is this? This is not a waste of time, you know, why? Why are we doing it? Why are you doing it? Right? So not everybody will understand okay, the, the kind of time, the kind of effort, 
uh, is the you know that you put in in order to see God, in order to be in His presence uh, corporately. Right? Not everybody will understand. So we need to be aware. Yes, in in this case, we see that not everyone understood. Right? Everybody was looking at the superficial things, and everybody is making you know their own coming to their own conclusions about you know how this oil could have been used, how this perfume could have been used in a better way, and so on. Right? Um, so we see that yes, the worship of Lord, rather than appreciation, it might attract the other extreme of it. You know, they might defame, they might ridicule, they might make fun of, um, but be ready for that. Right? And these disciples who journeyed with him, right, for them it was a lesson in worship. Right? Though they had heard the teachings of the Lord, though they had, you know, they had asked the Lord the questions and he responded and they were with him, they were traveling with him, you know. But here was a person who had experienced the power of the Lord, experienced the transformative power of God. And who really worshipped in spirit and truth. Right? So the disciples themselves, for them, you know, it was an eye opener. For them, they just saw this. When they saw this, uh, I'm sure it stayed with them, right? So, so as leaders, as followers of the Lord, as leaders, as maybe you know, God, Lord has put us in places of spiritual leadership. You know, worship should not be relegated. To someone who can sing well, someone who can play music well. No. no. As leaders, I mean, we may have a great voice, we may not have a great voice, but we are called to be worshippers. Right? And we need to lead by example in worshiping God. Okay. Many times, you know, let's say the Lord, you know puts you in a place of spiritual leadership, maybe as a pastor or whatever, you know. We need to lead by example. Okay. And, and maybe it's the tradition in the church or maybe it's the cultural thing where, you know, the, you know if you're the leader, you come in at the last minute maybe, <laughs> you know, just for the message. Somebody's leading worship, somebody's doing it, and then you come in, you know, just as the message is about to start. You know, you can change that. You can lead by example by being part of the time of corporate worship. And, and by taking part, not by checking the phone, not by you know getting distracted with you know, or maybe speaking to others. No, no, no. By really giving weightage to what is happening there, right? That time of worship, uh, worshiping together, by giving importance to that, by being engaged in that. Right? Not because people are watching, but because that is that is who you are, a worshiper. So you value that time spent with God together as a as a corporate body, right? And you know, a, a, as leaders, as believers, we need to lead by example, right? So this is something that we need to you know, understand. We need to put in practice as well, and it's a privilege for us to do this, right? And what really sets us apart? Or what really sets this time of seeking God and gathering together, what sets it apart is truly the presence of God, right? the presence of the Lord. The Lord himself, right? he, he inhabits the praises of his people. So the presence of the Lord makes a huge difference to the gathering of God's people. Right? We all carry the indwelling presence of the Lord. But as a you know, as a body of believers, as we gather together, you know, corporately as well, we carry the uh, the abiding presence of the Lord. You know, two two verses talk about this. If you look at one Corinthians three and one Corinthians six, right? Um, okay, one Corinthians chapter three, and if you look at Okay, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Yeah, I'll just read it. Yeah. It says, uh, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, whose temple or which temple you are. 
okay so in that chapter god is ad, uh, sorry paul is addressing that church collectively he's telling them you are the temple of god he's telling them as a group because earlier on in the chapter he's addressing you know you you cannot have division you cannot have strife yeah, you know you're fighting with one another you you cannot do that right so he's talking to them collectively as a body you know as as a church and he's saying you don't you know that you are the temple of god and the spirit of god abides in you okay if you look at uh, chapter 6 right just turn over to chapter 6 and if you look at verse 19 okay, again the end of the chapter verses 19 and 20 says do you not know that your body, so here he's talking about specifically about the individual, right? About the person individually, and because he's talking about sexual immorality and, and all those kind of sins, and, and so he's, he's addressing them as a person. He's saying, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Verse 20 For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay? So both personally and well, as well as corporately, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We have the presence of God. Okay? So that's something that we need to understand. So what makes the difference for us you know, in all our gathering together is the presence of God. Okay? So um, when, we, when we talk about the presence of God, no, there are some certain things to consider, right? The presence of God is God Himself personally, right? Being present. And we become aware of His presence, right? Like three things when we, when we talk about the presence of God. The first thing is that God is omnipresent, right? That's one of the characteristics of God, you know, which means He's present everywhere. We know that he is omnipresent. God is present everywhere. Um, and that's what makes him God. So his presence is here with us right now. right? So we know that he is omnipresent. Wherever you go, his presence is there. The second thing that we need to consider is his promised presence. Where the Lord Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. Right? So he has promised his presence, saying, you gathered in my name, you're doing something in my name, right? For the plan and purpose um, that I have. So you gather together, I am there. Right? And the third thing that we see, that we read in scripture, is the tangible presence of God. Right? The tangible presence of God, which we see when, when the temple of um, you know, Solomon built, when it was in inaugurated. Okay? Second Chronicles 5 talks about that. So they were inaugurating the temple. You can you can sit there, yeah. So they were inaugurating the temple. The the priests were there. They were worshiping. The musicians were there. The singers were there, and uh, together, you know, they were worshiping. So the Bible says that the presence of God, the glory of God, filled the temple. So much so, it was like a cloud that filled the temple, and they could not continue in worship. Okay, Second Chronicles 5 talks about that. They could not continue. So it talks about the tangible, real, manifest presence, what we call as the manifest presence of God. You know, something that becomes tangible or visible to our physical senses. Right? So omnipresent, well, we may be aware of his presence, we may not be. But he's present. He's there. The promised present, yeah, by faith we know that he is there because that is what he's promised according to his word. The manifest presence of God is something that, that we tangibly experience in our spirit and maybe even to our physical senses. Right? The tangible, the manifest presence of God. Okay, So we need to understand this. Okay, the, When we talk about the presence of God, we need to understand what is the presence of God? Right? Because God has promised His presence, uh, and also the yeah, yeah, Shani, uh, you have a question. Yeah, I just so I'm just want to make sure I understand. I know you're saying in terms of as, as believers, individuals, we have the Holy. I guess when we worship, mm. His presence is there, and we also have the Holy Spirit. But are you saying that when we meet with other believers, like you said, corporate, is His presence magnified or is just tangible? That's what I'm kind of 
want oh, to I make see. sure okay the difference between the second one and the third one right so yeah so when when the believers gather together the lord has promised his presence which means his presence is there and we can with faith and expectation we can go with the expectation that he is already there but there is also the manifest presence of god which means that his presence becomes uh, we become aware of his presence in a tangible manner to our physical senses through our physical senses like maybe through our you know what we see uh, maybe through things that we experience physically even so that is what we talk about as the manifest presence of god yes like you said you know it could happen when believers are gathering together it could also happen when you are just all alone i think that's the difference where you experience the manifest presence of god right okay i think i understand so it's presence okay so that's a manifest um more yeah. kind of when it's kind of tangible but this is its presence more when you're around other people or like when you're at church as opposed to individually when you're worshiping and that's what i'm trying to figure out too yeah it, it could happen it could happen and the, and the example that we see is in you know second chronicles 5 it talks about the manifest presence of god very clearly and uh, so that is something when corporately uh, people gather together, we can experience. But also that doesn't mean that when you're on your own, that you don't experience the manifest presence of God. So the Bible is full of, you know, encounters where they, the presence of God was so uh, tangible to them, you know, individually, where they fell down, they lost, you know, strength in their physical bodies and, and so on. So, you know, so that is also possible on your own. Um, it is possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, just want to draw our attention to this uh, book called "The Presence of God." Okay. Uh, for all of us, I've actually put it in the the, the material resource um, section. Um, if you're an online student, you go go to the classwork section, uh, and then under course material, it is there, so you can uh, download it. And also, those of us here in person. You know, you can also uh, do that same. Go to the website, download it, or a soft copy, or maybe there's a physical copy. You can make use of it. Talks about the presence of God, right? So, um, so let's let's look at it. I just uh, maybe I'll just share the notes here a little bit, and uh, um, just to start off, you know, about the presence of God, and uh, you can read on your own, right? Um, one, just a minute. Okay. Right. So, um, like when we when we consider Moses in the Old Testament, right? Moses, um, he led the Israelites. He had encounters with God. Yes or no? Yeah, he had encounters with God in the sense he experienced God like none of the others did. Right? He would go into the tabernacle. The, the Bible says that you know, he would walk in to that tent of meeting and you know, the Lord would descend. And he would, which means that he took the initiative. He would just go there and then he would experience God would meet with him and talk to him face to face. Right? So he experienced that. And, and all the supernatural things that happen. Now just imagine that he would, you know, the Lord sends him to Egypt. And um, you know he he is he has never done this before. There's no precedent for him, right? He's just believing God, and God saying, "Okay, you take that staff and you do this, and this will happen." And and so he's experienced the supernatural. He he's carrying that staff. Just can you just imagine? He's just been carrying that and walking with that uh, that rod, and suddenly he goes there and he tr throws it down, and it becomes a becomes a serpent, becomes a snake, and you know, all these amazing things he has seen. He's seen the power of God in action in, in, in his life and through his hands. Right? Now, this Moses, if you would go to um, you know, Exodus 33 and verse 18. Okay, let's look at that verse. Exodus 33. Okay, Exodus 33 and verse... Um, verse 18. 
He says, please show me your glory. Okay. Lord, please show me your glory. And the Lord says, responds to him, he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion, and so on. Right. The same thing, if you, if you back up to um, you know, verse 30, um, 33, uh, sorry, sorry, no, not 33, 13, right? Verse 13, he says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight. That I may know you, and that I may find, find grace in your sight. Okay, he's had these conversations with God, and he's seen, or he has traveled with God, uh, you know, through all those, you know, all those. He has really journeyed with God. He has experienced much, and at the end of it, he's saying, "God, show me your glory." And here he says, "Lord, uh, that I may know you, that I may know you more." If you go down to verse 15, he says, uh, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Right? Saying, if your presence, you know, I don't want to step into something, I don't want to journey into something where your presence is not there. If you are not with us, I don't want to step into that. Now, you need to understand this is the old dispensation, right? That the presence of God would come, the Spirit of God would fill a, a person, maybe a group of people uh, for a period of time, for an assignment, and it was it was uh, that dispensation before the cross, right? And he's, so Moses is praying, you know, he's crying out to God, he's saying, you know, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. I don't want to get into that place, right? And, uh, and it says, how then will it be known, verse 16, that your, your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us. So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. What made that distinction? The presence of God. Right? So after seeing all this, he's crying out and saying, God, I need your presence. Show me your glory. Right? So that's how much he realized. He realized, after seeing all this, he realized that, the presence of God is something that I value. The presence of God is something that I need, that we need as a people. Right? So without which I cannot, I cannot move forward. So the psalmist, you know, Psalm 34 and verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, verse 8. Right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. In other in the words, he's saying, you know, experience. The presence of God. Taste and see. Experience. He's saying, you know, uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So it means an experiential understanding, an experiential knowledge of the Lord's goodness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, so this psalmist, this is, this is what he says in Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 4. Um, we can read that, Psalm 27, okay. verse 4 and verse 8. But the psalmist says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Right. And then he goes on to say, um, And uh, all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. If you go down to verse Verse 8, he says, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Right? So this is a psalmist. And, and we realize that this is the old dispensation. Right? We're talking about the time before the cross. And this was the level of hunger. And this was the dependence on God and the presence of God. Right? So he's saying that this is one thing that I desire. This is one thing that I will seek. And so on, he said, when, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, 
your face, Lord, I will see. In other words, when we see that, you know, the presence of God is to seek the face of God. Right? Is to is to is to choose to gaze upon the Lord, the beauty of the Lord. So uh, the psalmist says this. Another place, Psalm 42, verse, verses 1 and 2. Says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Now, question. Did, did the psalmist sit in a secluded place by himself, just playing his guitar, his harp, spend the whole time writing songs, uh, worshipping God, and, uh, and doing all this? No. Did he do that? What do you think? What was his day like? Taking care of the sheep. And in one season, taking care of the sheep. That was his responsibility. You know, taking them out for grazing, protecting the sheep, bringing them back. Probably he would have had time to sit, reflect, you know, think about what about God, write some song. Okay. Next season of his life, what was he doing? Fighting battles, right? Um, he would go, he behaved very wisely in Saul's presence, the king's presence, and he he was faithful, he was fighting battles on behalf of the king, and this is what he did, right? The next season of his life, what did he do? He was running for his life. He was like literally a fugitive, running for his life, right? Saul, Saul's army were hunting him down, he literally ran for his life. Another phase of his life, he's leading his people, his own, you know, his, the 300 men, uh, they, you know, they kind of come to a place where, the, you know, that battle, uh, where they lose everything, and they said, you know, they turn against him as well. So, and then we see that he's crowned as king of whole, all of Israel, and in all seasons of his life, right? It's not like he is sitting, doing something. You know, the, sometimes we think like that. You know, if I didn't have this, if I didn't have my responsibility, if I didn't have to take care of the sheep, you know, if I. So, what is the sheep that you're taking care of, right? What is your responsibility? You know, maybe as a student, you have responsibilities. Maybe as a parent, you have responsibilities. Maybe as a you know, working professional, you have responsibilities. You know, in every season of our lives, we have responsibilities. As a king, he had responsibilities. Right? He was busy. Right? If you look at any world leader of contemporary times, you, you see that they have a lot of things to do. Their day, their day starts very early. The night ends very late. There's travel, there's a lot of things, meeting, decisions to be made, important decisions, difficult decisions, uh, all those things to be you know, done in a day. So the psalmist, in all this, is saying, one thing I desire and that I will do, that I will seek the face of the Lord. If you, if you look at the Psalm 42, verse 1, to two, uh, 1 and 2, he says, My soul longs for you, my soul... My, so, Pants my soul for you, O God, as the deer pants for the water. Right? My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 63, this was in the wilderness. He said, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary uh, to see, this is verse 8, to see you. Your power and your glory, my soul follows God close behind you. Your right hand upholds me, and so on. So we see that it's not, it's in the normal course of life with all responsibilities, challenges, you know, pressure of time, all that. His heart is to see God. So he valued, just like all the others in the Bible that we see. Moses, for example, he valued the presence of God. Right? He valued the presence of, esteemed the presence of God. Right. So, uh, so also in our in our own lives, we need to seek after the presence of God. We need to seek after God. Right. 
the presence of god is not something that we call upon you know while leading worship or during the time of corporate worship no you know we value esteem the presence of god right through right through our journey right through whatever we are doing in life we value esteem and hunger after the presence of god right this is what god says isaiah 44 verses 3 and 4 god's response to the person who seeks him god's response to the person who seeks after him who hungers for him right isaiah 44 verse 3 says for i will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground what is he talking about he says i will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring they will spring up among the grass like willows by the water courses so he says i will pour out my spirit like water and flood but what is the what is the criteria what is the condition one who is thirsty saying hey if if you are thirsty if you are hungry for more if you are thirsty for more saying god i i really need you right it's and no other agenda you're saying my heart is really longing for you god you know i just i just barely scratched the surface yes i you know experienced certain things i've seen certain things i've you know i've understood certain things but god i my heart longs for you right so the lord says for such a person that he will pour out his spirit he will pour out water it's like water and like flood you know different different capacities or different quantities right saying this is what i will do several other places jeremiah 29 13 you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart so wholeheartedly when we seek after him when we say cry out and say god i want more i'd like to you know know you more and this is this was the cry of paul as well right um and the lord jesus you know um, before we go there the lord jesus says matthew chapter 5 blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled right so um when we look at uh, the apostle paul he had something um a similar lines right he this is what he cry out or what he cried out um let's turn to um, um okay just a second okay so he, he says uh, this is what he says in uh, in uh, philippians chapter 3 right philippians chapter 3 verse 12 not that i have already attained or am already perfected but i press on that i may lay hold of that for which christ jesus has also laid hold of me right brethren i do not count myself to have apprehended now this is all writing after all that he has seen all that the lord has done through his hands right after all that he's saying you know it's not uh, that i've already attained or already i've already perfected or already i have apprehended but one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those which are ahead verse 14 i press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of god in christ i press on for the upward call of god in christ jesus right um in another place um um yeah let's look at uh, philippians 3 and verse 7 uh, i'll just come back i think somebody's uh, answer the question Yeah, uh Shani you have a question. Go ahead please. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm confused because I know yep. in terms of the um as believers when you set when you set Jesus you learn save you have the Holy Spirit in you. So yep. what's I'm confused. So what is the difference between that and his presence if he's already in you? I don't know if that makes sense. Um no, sorry, repeat your question again. Where is the uh... So so it, Because I know when you said the Jesus Christ Lord said you have the Holy Spirit, you know, yeah. in you. So right. I'm kind of confused about His presence. What's the difference if you already have Him in you? Yeah, you, I'm confused on that. Yeah, he's all. He's he's already with us. 
Right, when we're talking about the manifest presence, we're talking about we becoming aware, um, our physical senses being aware of his presence in our lives. And also, when we talk about the presence of God, we see that there are varying degrees to which we experience the presence of God. Right? So, so that's, that is what we're talking about when we talk about the manifest presence of God. Yes, he is with us. We're not, there's, no, no, there's no dispute on that. He is with us. Um, but then there is more to him that he wants to reveal, he wants to show. And that is why we see you know, Paul even crying out, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Right. So uh, why is he crying out when he ha already has the indwelling presence of God? Why is he you know, ca calling out uh, on God and saying, you know, I'm, Oh, that I may know him? So it's because there are, there's more to God because he's infinite. We are finite. There's more to what he can reveal. There's more to what we can experience tangibly uh, about God. There's more to what we can receive from him. Right. So, um, yeah. So that is why Paul cries out. And that is also something that can be our cry as well, as the Lord himself promises and says that I will pour out water. I will cause floods to, to you know, water to come out like floods. Uh, experience uh, like floods on one who is thirsty. Okay, so I understand. It's like the more the presence, more in terms of like uh, manifestation, tangible. That's basically mm. what you're saying. Yeah, that's one aspect of it, and also in terms of revelation, and also in terms of experiencing maybe the power of God through the gifts and so on. So there's more. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay, so. So Paul cries out uh, and he says, you know, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So you see that there is a, you know, there is a hunger. There is a, you know, there is a holy dissatisfaction, right? Um, discontent saying, God, I, I just need more, right? Which, which the Lord says that he will satisfy, but that creates an even more hunger for more of him, right? So what kills our appetite? Right. Let's say you have a meal, and you have to go have a meal, lunch, and then you have one big snack, one full bag of one packet of potato chips you eat. It's going to kill your appetite, right, for the meal. So, spiritually speaking, what is it that is killing your appetite? I need to ask myself, what is it that's killing my appetite for God? Right? When you say appetite, this hunger for God, this thirst for God, this desire for God, what is killing that? What is taking that place? What is slowly taking away, eroding, you know, that hunger, that desire you know, for God? And we know it could be blatant sin, right? It could be or something like what Hebrews talks about. Hebrews 12, we see that um, it says, um, do, throw away those things, those unnecessary weights, right? Hebrews 12, and um, let me just, yeah, uh, Hebrews 12 and verse 2, right? Or maybe it's verse, yeah, uh, verse 1 itself, right? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily en ensnares us and let us run with endurance so these weights the sin you know what is it that is taking away the passion that we have for god yes you know sometimes you realize wow i, I wish i could be like this always right i wish i could i could have this strong desire this thing this interest in the word of god this this passion for prayer and spending time with god i wish you know, it just continues like that. I wish it doesn't drop, but it does. Right? And we must be aware, hey, something has changed. What is causing this? Right? What is causing this? Because if we are not aware, then we will just continue. Our hearts will be, you know, truly, I don't know, kind of seared, not aware, insensitive right, to the things of God. And then time would have passed, and then we realize, hey, I used to be like this, but now things have changed. Things have cooled down. I've become hardened, right? And 
the bible talks about these very apparent things like sin and the weights you know some things that hold us back that slow us down weigh us down right other things could also be discouragement right some practical things that we can consider discouraged maybe we are discouraged discouraged from maybe unanswered prayers discouraged from whatever people because of people what people have said so what we have done is when we become discouraged we stop seeking god from whom we get comfort and hope the bible declares god to be the god of hope and comfort but because we are discouraged because we are offended because we are you know whatever hurt we stop from seeking him from whom we receive hope from whom we receive comfort right we stop we distance ourselves from god from the one who can actually heal the one who can actually restore right so here we are exhorted we are encouraged to follow after him to pursue him because there is always more okay so um so let's uh, let's move on um in the old testament the way they access the presence of god uh, or went to the presence of god was through the tabernacle of moses right it was a journey it was a passage from the outer court um to the inner court the outer court which had the altar of sacrifice we look at it in detail a little later so in the old testament this is this is what they did right they went and only the high priest had the the authority to go to the holy of holies right but in the new testament right if you look at hebrews 10 okay let's turn to hebrews 10 and verse 19 hebrews 10 and verse 19 says therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of jesus okay the lord has made a way for us what what is it talks it says having boldness right which means you've given access and also hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 right hebrews 10 and verse 19 therefore having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of god let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water so this is the invitation this is the exhortation let us draw near right with this understanding that yes there has been a way you come with there's been a way that is made to come to the holiest by the blood of jesus so you enter in boldly right another verse in hebrews itself is hebrews chapter 4 right hebrews chapter 4 and verses 15 and 16 hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need okay so he's talking about the throne of god he's talking about coming boldly to the throne of grace right again drawing near to god's presence drawing near to god himself drawing drawing near to his grace and mercy to receive his grace and mercy right but how should we come he says with boldness come boldly right both these scriptures talk about us coming boldly because of the finished work of jesus because of the blood that was shed because of the way that has been made now so it's not trusting in our own righteousness that will never give us boldness that will never give us confidence but when we trust in the righteousness of christ with just covered you that will give us boldness right to draw near with boldness and draw near in faith Hebrews 10 says draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith be fully assured be fully assured in what Christ has done be fully assured in faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with water right so 
Um, so this is this is the thing that we have. This is what enables us as believers, as New Testament believers, to enter into the presence of God. Okay. Um, okay. So let's let's look at this verse um, that Paul. Uh, that we were just talking about, you know, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, uh, just Philippians chapter 3 and verses 7 to 11. Okay. Philippians 3 verses 7 to 11. Again, the way the Lord uh, Paul esteemed uh, the things of God, Paul esteemed the presence of God, right? Uh, Philippians 3 verse 7. Okay, maybe you, you, you might have to write down in your notes. Um, it might not be there. So Philippians 3 verse 7. Right? So it says, what things were gained for me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Okay. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but with that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So he, you know, his look at how he is counting all things. He before the before that, you know, verse five onwards, he's talking about his lineage. He's talking about his, you know, the the past and the kind of background that he has, the kind of um, uh, education that he has had, the kind of training that he has had as a fab Pharisee, all that. And then he says, you know. What things were gained for me, these things I consider at loss for the sake of Christ. I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. So this knowledge of salvation, this knowledge of Jesus, this relationship with him, for him, this meant everything. He esteemed it higher than all the other things, his education, his experience, his training as a Pharisee, all that. And, and he also says, I count them as rubbish. Okay, and the word Greek word used there is, you know, he refuse something like a you know, like a excreta. In other words, that is what he's saying, right? Like dung. He's using a strong word, saying all that in comparison with Christ, it's like refuse. Right? And then you say, oh, that I may know him. But Paul, you've already gone on these mission trips and, you know, you've planted churches, you've taught people about, you know, all things from salvation to Holy Spirit to gifts of the Spirit to end times. You've taught them all these things. You've written, you know, two thirds of the New Testament. Paul is saying, no, no, no. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Which is why he's saying, you know, he's saying, hey, there's a hunger deep within. There's so much more that I want to know. There's so much more that I need to hear from him, experience from him. Right? So that can be our cry as well. If that, because if that is the criteria, then God would pour out. Right? You know, as Bible college students and, and, you know, as pastors, as teachers, if that is our criteria, and if that is our cry, saying, God, you know, I'm hungry for more. I'm hungry for more. The Lord would pour out. The Lord would cause floods. So, so why don't we, uh, before we close, why don't we just pray and ask the Lord, Lord, I, we want that to be our cry. Right? We want that to be our cry. As people who know you, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, we want that to be our cry. Yes, Lord, we come before you, Lord, with all humility, God. We come before you, bowing down before you, the God of heaven and earth. And Lord, we come before you, Lord, saying, God, let nothing kill our appetite for you, God. Let nothing take away that desire for you, Master Lord. As the psalmist cried out, O oh God, Lord, as the deer pants for the water, so our soul longs for you, Father God. As Paul cried out, Lord, that we may know you, 
and the power of your resurrection, God. And as Moses cried out, oh God, oh God, if your presence will not be with us, then we don't want to go into the future, Father God. Oh God, that we may know you, that Lord, we cry out like Moses, show us your glory. Yes, Lord, that's the cry of our heart, oh God, for each one of us, oh Master. And Lord, if we have really cried out in all sincerity, Lord, you have said that you will pour out, Lord, water on him, whom, on, on him who is thirsty. And Lord, we desire for more of you. Yes, Lord, continue to lead us into all that you have. Yes, Lord, greater depths and greater heights, God. Take us, Lord, with you, Master. We thank you. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll stop here and uh, we'll meet again next class. God bless.